Welcome to Lecture 6. Dr. JC here. We're going to take this in two parts. The first part in this lecture, we're going to cover the Han Dynasty, Han China. And we're looking at uh, about the same time period as Rome, the middle part of Rome. So the latter part of the Roman Republic to the early part of the Roman Empire. And if Rome was the power of the ancient world in the West, we could think of the Han as the power of the ancient world in the East. Now those two will never throw down the Romans and the Han, but it might have been an interesting cage match had that occurred. The second part of the lecture, which will come in the next uh, segment, we're going to talk a little bit about Mesoamerica or these ancient uh, advanced civilizations in Central and South America. So let's start with the Han first. Prior to discussing Liu Bang, this commoner that's going to help bring rise to this Han Dynasty, it's worth noting here that not only will this Han Dynasty be the second imperial dynasty in, Ch in Chinese history, the first was the Qin, but that most Chinese today, the ethnic majority of Chinese today, still refer to themselves as Han. And in fact, the characters or script in China today is of Han origin. So while we might think of this as like happening a long, long time ago, and it did because we're talking about the same time as Rome, most Chinese today, ethnically and through their writings, still recognize themselves as being Han. Relating specifically to Liu Bang, it's kind of interesting to note that here that he's one of the few emperors in Chinese history that's going to be born from a peasant class. This isn't some dude with some silver spoon in his mouth. And in some ways, his upbringing, he was, uh, by all accounts, some patrol officer or something like that in the Qin Dynasty, part of this larger state of Chu. And for those of you that did the Sun Tzu writing piece, you might recognize the name Chu, the state of Chu, because that's the state that was at war with Wu, Sun Tzu's state. So there is some ties there to Sun Tzu in some ways. But Liu Bang himself was an individual that wasn't the most charismatic dude on the planet. He's not going to give up there, get up there and give some major stump, stump speech and people are going to be like freaking fired up. That wasn't the case. What he did have, however, was just this sort of good old-fashioned, down-home, work-hard, get-her-done type attitude. And this perseverance is ultimately what's going to help him unify China under his own leadership. The other thing that's going to help Liu Bang maintain control, in fact, create a very strong centralized state here and imperial rule, was the fact that he was a peasant. He recognized what life was like for the average everyday Joe in China, and you know what? It wasn't really any sort of freaking cup of tea, pardon the pun, right? One of the first things that Liu Bang is going to do to endear himself to the Chinese people as part of this larger Han expansion is the idea that we're going to abandon and move away from legalist principles. We're not doing that game anymore. And you say, well, wait a minute, I've heard this legalism somewhere before. You're right, you did. In an earlier lecture on India and China, especially that component as it relates to China, we talked about three Chinese philosophies of order. Confucianism, Taoism slash Taoism, and legalism. Legalism was that ism established by this guy named Shang Yang, and it called for what? A strong centralized state where individuals within Chinese society were not citizens, they were subjects, and you are to be driven for the betterment of the state. Liu Bang says, you know what, dude, I lived that policy, and it stunk. Therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and change course here. We're not going to rule through fear. We're going to rule through toleration. And what Liu Bang will do almost immediately is cut taxes. He will eliminate this system of corvée, as the French would call it. What that is, is it required individuals to work for the state, to do public works for the state, basically for free. You were required X number of hours a week to work for the state. He's going to get rid of that as well. And as you might imagine, almost immediately the Chinese people are going to love this guy for this. Throughout his life, Liu Bang is going to focus on a program of reform for Chinese people. 
and that's when it's going to help establish a really firm foundation for the Han dynasty moving forward. Whether or not he really subscribed to the teachings of Confucius and or Lao Tzu, that we strengthen society or we strengthen the individual, we don't really know. My guess is he probably just recognized what was going to work for him and his fellow quote-unquote peasants when he was growing up. And he just figured, look, if the government had focused on this, 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 and this, we would all much been better off. And I think that uh, his upbringing did help shape his, his policy. Therefore, the legacy of Liu Bang is he will create a centralized state and he will create a very strong foundation for future Han leaders to build from. One such future leader happens to be the individual depicted at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, Han Wudi, also known to history as the Martial Emperor. Just as Liu Bang would be remembered for his work in creating the Han Dynasty, Han Wudi must be remembered as the individual that led the Han to its greatest strength, its greatest imperial expansion. The greatness and height of the Han will be under Han Wudi's reign, and he has to be remembered for that, largely because of his policies. We'll talk about those policies next. There are going to be two broad policy avenues that Han Wudi is going to focus his attention and his time and effort. The first happens to be imperial expansion. The dynasty is going to grow immensely, especially from a geographic standpoint. From Korea and Vietnam in the east all the way to the modern day Istans, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, that region in the Near East. This huge swath of geographic space is going to fall under Han control. It's an immense amount of territory. There are several reasons why they were able to do that. Some of those are listed here on this slide. I might encourage those that are interested to research it further as well. The second policy avenue that Han Wudi is going to pursue, and to me the harder of the two to make happen, quite frankly, is political and administrative centralization. Han Wudi is going to create this unique blend of a governmental structure that is really legalist in nature, going right back to Shang Yang, this, you know, create order in society through a strong state. He will have that set up in his governmental bodies in his structure. In fact, the people that he appoints will be those that embrace legalism. That said, he's going to also tap the brakes on that a little bit and say, look, we will have legalist principles apply to industry and trade, but we are not going to have them apply to social policy. As it relates to social policy, we're going to allow the people to go ahead and create and innovate, live their lives, live according to the philosophy of Confucius. So what he's going to have set up then is a bureaucratic or governmental structure that's focused on legalist principles, that the state will control certain things, like the iron industry, like the salt industry. And the state then will use those funds from those industries to help make improvements for society. Better roads, better services, so on and so forth. These are the things that are going to be put into place by Han Wudi. And as a result of this unique sort of blend of legalism and Confucianism, the, the Han as a dynasty and as a people is going to grow. So their military ex will expand. At the same time, society is going to hum along as well. As the old adage goes, all good things must come to an end. And despite the best of intentions and application of policies as put into place by Han Wudi, over time, the people are going to tire of these policies, largely because they're just going to get flat out too expensive. You can't continue to spend money willy-nilly on foreign policy trying to expand your borders. At the same time, you're trying to spend money willy-nilly on domestic policy, building roads, canals, a great wall. There's just not enough money to do all this stuff at the same time. And as a result of that, the state then, the legalist individuals that were running the state, began to turn the screws on the average everyday Chinese citizen, asking for more taxes, taking their lands, 
And as a result of this, it's going to lead to a huge divide in Chinese society and Han society. So much so that it's going to lead to a break in the Han dynasty. There's going to be a brief, brief break in the Han dynasty and Han rulership. That's why you'll see sometimes historians refer to, and me on the slides, a former Han and a later Han. The former and later comes before and after this dude right here, Wang Mang. First and foremost, Wang Mang is not a crappy one-hit wonder 1980s band. All right, it's not. It's actually a guy. It's actually a guy that existed. He was part of the Han Dynasty. This was a gentleman that was imbued with a sense of Confucianism. He, I think, he was a good guy at heart. To be honest with you, he looked to try to seize power himself, and he will for a period of time. He will make himself emperor. And part of the way he's going to make himself emperor is to promise all sorts of freebies to Chinese people. In some ways, I want you to think of the Gracchus brothers we talked about in Rome. The Gracchus brothers, you may recall, those individuals that talked about seizing land from the wealthy patricians, those latifundium in Rome, taking their lands and redistributing that land and wealth to average Romans. Wang Mang is going to do the same thing here in China. And for a while, it's going to be very popular. Why wouldn't it be? If you're going to get free stuff from the government, this is cool, right? The problem, however, over time is not just the fact that the government can't continuously spend money it doesn't have. At some point, if you continue to take or tax from those that have it, you're not going to be able to continue to run to that well. That's point one. Point two, it's sheer nature of people themselves. It's really hard to get people pleased and satisfied. As an example of point two, and how hard it is to satisfy people, even when they're given free stuff, right, is this example. I often use it. It's one that's been recorded from the history there. That individuals would be given a plot of land. Let's say, just say two individuals were given 50 acres of land each, right? One individual gets land that's very fertile. There's a few trees. It's a nice area to farm. The person next to him gets a little bit crappier land. There's stumps and there's some swamp and it's harder work to try to organize this. So rather than say, hey, thanks government for the 50 acres of land, what do you think the guy that got the crappier piece of land did? Complained. <laughs> yeah, never mind the fact, dude, you got it for free. You're going to complain, right? Because it wasn't as good as the next guy's. And this is part of the problem. It's hard to keep baby bears porridge the right temperature when we're talking about thousands hundreds of thousands or in China's case millions of people and as a result of that the peasants that were given this free stuff start to get upset about it sensing a growing frustration amongst the peasantry this is when large landowners bureaucrats individuals that have suffered under Wang Mang they see an opportunity to strike back and they will do that they will call an end to Wang Mang's rule. That will happen. And as a result of that, the Han family is brought back. And we start this later Han dynasty. The problem, however, is the damage has already been done. Wang Mang has undone much of what Han Wudi had put into place. There's jealousies in the bureaucratic structure. So legal, those applying legalist principles now, there's a lot of infighting there. There's a lot of jealousy amongst the peasant population. And as a result of this, over time, that order and harmony that existed under Han Wudi will be undone by Wang Mang himself. And there's not going to be any return. Just like in Rome, where civil wars start to break out and it helps facilitate and foster and precipitate a fall of the empire, the same thing is going to happen here in the Han as well. And right around 220, so a couple hundred years before the collapse of Rome, we're going to see civil war ensue here in the Han. It will break into three larger states. Eventually, these three larger states will be reconsolidated under a single rule, a new family rule, and a new dynasty and age will begin under the Jin. So such is the brief history here of the glorious, so style glorious Han Empire. Hope this at least whetted everybody's appetite and that you do a little bit more research on, on these guys. Very impactful individuals to be sure. Let's head next to Mesoamerica for part two.